Hey guys, in this next video we're going to continue where we left off and start looking at entities, the basic building blocks of pretty much everything in Ursina. We're going to look at a lot today, so I'd really recommend pausing after each line and having a play around with the code as we go. To start off with, let's go back to our window that we created last time. If we want to add an entity, all we need to use is entity, followed by a pair of brackets, and then we can assign that to a variable. In this case, let's just call it first entity. It isn't doing much yet, but that's because we still need to give it a model. We can start by saying model equals cube. This is one of the built-in models that comes with Ursina, and you can see there are a few more from this list that we can choose to use if we want. However, if you want to add your own model, the easiest way is just to put the file in the same folder as your code, then replace cube with the model name. It's important to note that you don't need the file extension for this. So it would look something a bit like this, where we have a file called your model with our code, and we don't put .obj at the end here. But let's just stick with the cube for now, as it's a bit simpler. If we then want to change the colour of our cube, we can use the colour argument. I most often set this just using colour.rgb and then you can pass in the red, green and blue values. There are many preset colours to choose from also, so I could just say colour equals and then colour.red instead and I would get the same result. I will put a link to this section of the cheat sheet, so you can take a look at all the ways to set colour when you have time. We can also add textures to our model, as you can see here with texture equals brick. You can either use the built-in ones or your own textures, similar to the way you would use your own models. In this list you can see the built-in textures that you have available. The next thing that's important to set is the position of our entity. The first way to do this is to set the position in each axis like this. X refers to the position horizontally, Y refers to the position vertically, and finally Z refers to the position almost going in and out of the screen. However, it is probably simpler to set it this way, where you can either put X, Y, Z in a tuple, a list, or a VEC3 object, which is essentially just a vector describing movement in three dimensions. The same thing works for rotation to describe how much the object is turned about each axis. And we can also set that just using a tuple. The final of these three main transformations is scale. We can either set this for each of the three axis directions separately, or we can set it using a tuple, or finally, if we want to keep the proportions exactly the same, we can just use a single number. Just one small thing that can be useful while you are developing is the editor camera that allows you to look around your scene. Simply type editor camera and close it off with a pair of brackets. If we want to add movement, the first thing we need to do is create a new function called update. This is the function that the game is going to call on every frame, so it's really important to put stuff here if you want it to happen while your game is running. Then, say we wanted our cube to rotate, we can control that by increasing rotation y by 1 each frame. 
We might see some issues with this though. Say if we did a side by side comparison between this running at 60 frames and 30 frames. You should notice that when we have less frames, the cube will be turning less because it is receiving less commands to turn per second. If we want to fix that, we just need to multiply the increase by time.dt, or in other words, the small change in time between each frame. This means that if the time between each frame is increased, say as a result of a lower frame rate, the amount that the cube turns will also be increased proportionally to that, so the overall rate at which it turns is going to stay the same. As we are multiplying the turn by a number less than 1 now, the turn each frame would be a lot smaller, so let's use 50 for our turn rate instead to keep it spinning at a similar speed. We might also want to change the position of our entity. If we want to move it forwards, we can just add first entity dot forward to its position. If you wanted to, you could use up, down, left, right and so on to move a different way. These are basically stored vectors, personal to each entity, and make your life a lot easier. However, you can also move the entity by a vector of your choosing, just by adding a vec3 object to the position here. Again, we multiply this change by time.dt for the same reason as before. But for now, let's just uh, stick with the built-in forward vector. The final thing we're going to look at is the parent argument. As you can see, I've created this second entity, and I've made the first one its parent. All this means is that the two are linked, so any transformations happening to the parent, our first entity, are going to be inherited by the second one that we call the child. Any motion that the second entity does will all be relative to the first. A good example of this could be from a game like Sea of Thieves, where the player behaves as a child moving about on the parent ship, or the ship is still moving through the water. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Next time we will start to look at how we can take input from the user and begin to create a player that we can control. As always, please like, subscribe, and I'll see you in a bit.